I went to the local school, <clears throat> which was perfectly good, until the Nazis came to power. And even before, in Nuremberg, even before the Nuremberg laws, the anti-Semitism was horrendous. I mean, sitting in school, people would sing anti-Semitic songs. And when I think you had uh, uh, half the class were your friends, some people were your friends, all of a sudden, nobody spoke to you, neither the teachers nor your friends. Because of that pressure of the Nazis, have nothing to do with Jews. The children were intimidated. Their parents might lose their job or advancement. And it, it was really horrendous. But uh, one, it's, it's quite shocking, but <clears throat> they were singing a ditty. I, I'll do it in German first and then in English. Zwei Juden baden in einem Fluss, weil sich ne Sau mal waschen muss. Der eine ist ersoffen, vom anderen wollen wir es hoffen. Two Jews bathed in a water hollow, because even a pig has to clean itself. One quickly drowned, we hope the other one will follow. I mean, you're sitting there, 10 years of age, and they're, they're singing this into your face, so we, we knew, we knew this, this is no good. You became fairly isolated. You really, you stayed amongst your own family and friends. Fortunately, in Nuremberg, we had a twi twin town called Fürth, like Glasgow and Paisley, where there was an old established uh, Jewish grammar school, Israelitische Realschule Fürth, where we, we, we then went to Fürth and we had a fairly good upbringing. We knew we could not stay. My mother, my mother had great forethought. She took me out of school at the age of 14, which I, I, I didn't, I, I loved to be at school. She said, the reason, she said, I'm sorry, we, we have to leave here and you need to learn a trade, or a profession, something, so you can earn your living in another country. And how right she was. And I now think back, I mean, unbelievable. That's what happened. So I went to a, a strictly kosher hotel in Baden-Baden in the Black Forest as an apprentice until Kristallnacht. Well, Kristallnacht, we, we all know what happened in Kristallnacht. This horrendous, this horrendous affair of, of smashing all shops and houses. Because this young Greenbaum, Greenspan guy killed a German diplomat in, in Paris. And as uh, uh, Dr. Josef Goebbels said, the German nation rose up against the Jews. Well, I mean, horrendous. It was pre-planned, as we all know, in thousands of villages and towns. Uh, the synagogues were set on fire. They came to your house, they smashed the furniture, they turned over the sideboards, they slit the downies, everything was full of feathers. The men were taken away to concentration camp uh, for, for six weeks and told, this is what's going to happen to you. So we knew there's no end for us here. It was, uh, yeah, Kristallnacht was quite frightening. Uh, coming in from Nuremberg, of course. I mean, our synagogue was destroyed two years earlier. This notorious Nazi town, we, we, we were right in the middle of all that, particularly this newspaper, Der Stürmer, Julius Streicher, published in Nuremberg. It was not a pleasant time. Business-wise, you lose your business. You then could only deal with other Jewish people. So all your other customers, no matter what profession you were in, or whether you're a shopkeeper, whatever you were, you're a teacher, you were only allowed to do a deal with Jewish people. So everything shrank. This had an immediate impact on people's uh, wherewithal, on people's finances. It was very, very tough. And we all knew this is not going to end well. The Kinder Transport was this tremendous rescue operation. This uh, powerful Jewish committee, <coughs> Jewish committee and others, the Church of Scotland and the Red Cross, collected money and they went to the government and they said, could we at least save the children? Now, I point out particularly, they went to the Home Secretary. The Home Secretary of the time was Sir Samuel Hoare. He was a Quaker. Now, a Quaker has a wider, more liberal outlook. And Sir Samuel Hoare answered to this committee, if you have gathered the money, we, the government, will not put any obstacle in your way. Within three weeks, this bill went through Parliament and the trains began to roll. 
if this would happen today, there would be a committee of inquiry, we would all be dead. I mean, it just, these things don't happen anymore. Within three weeks, the government, I, I really say, they gripped the bull by the horns and they got on with it. And the train started to roll and these 9,000 odd children were saved. Fantastic. The, uh, the horror was to be taken to the train station, uh, say goodbye to your parents, would you ever see them again? Okay, I was 15 and a half. I had been away at the age of 14 in the big wide world, so I, I, I could cope with it. In the train I was surrounded by seven, eight-year-old boys and girls who had never been away from their mum and dad before. I mean, horrendous. The crying, the, can you imagine the trauma? After many hours, when we crossed the Dutch frontier and the German, the Nazi guards left the train, I mean, it just, the pressure lifted. By the time we arrived at the channel and then crossed by boat, arrived at Liverpool State Station, it must have been 18 hours, 24 hours. So you can imagine how traumatized everybody was, yes. But we were here, we were alive, and in Liverpool State Station, we were waiting for our guarantors, or those who didn't have guarantors to be sent to other schools. So it was a bit of a black hole and a bit of a cattle market. People did come and pick children, but they liked this one, they didn't like that one. So siblings got separated, but uh, I came straight to Glasgow. I had a guarantor in Glasgow, a very nice lady, a Jewish lady by, in her late 60s, uh, Mrs. Etta Harich, who took on a 15 and a half year old boy. Her family had grown up, so it was, for me, it was a wonderful experience. I was sent to school right away. I went to Queen's Park School right away. Uh, there was no hesitation. Mrs. Harridge wanted to, 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 you should be educated, yes. Queen's Park School, I, there were a few Jewish children in Queen's Park School, but as a German national, I, my name was Heinz. So they, they, they didn't make fun of me. They changed the Heinz to, uh, I was called at school, I was called 57. Heinz is baked beans, 57 varieties. So that was a sort of welcoming nickname. So I settled down at school fairly quickly. While I was here, my, my parents were in Nuremberg. My father died of a heart attack and my mother was then hidden by Catholic friends and taken to the country and she survived she survived the war and came here after the war. I, I understand you ended up in the Isle of Man. Can you explain why that was? Yes, I, I, you, you know, when, when war breaks out, all communication with the enemy country ceases. I had an uncle in Brussels. I sent letters to Brussels. He sent them to Nuremberg. This went on a few times. It is wartime. War had broken out. Corresponding with the enemy, it was a capital offense. I was arrested, I was taken to the High Court in Edinburgh at the age of 16. I remember Sir John Strachan, within half an hour, I became a dangerous enemy alien category A. I was taken by two detectives by train to Glasgow, given an hour to pack a case, and then they didn't know what to do with me. It took me to the police station, being, being Scotland, civilized country, by the way, uh, the sergeant said, can he take the lady, he's under 17. No allowed in a cell. So they took me to a remand home. Then I ended up in Mary Hill Barracks in an underground bunker for a fortnight with German merchant Navy sailors from the Icelandic Brigade. I ended up in Donaldson School in Edinburgh with these Nazi guys. It was horrendous. Eventually, I ended up in the Isle of Man. While I was, while I was in, in Edinburgh and in Mary Hill Barracks, Churchill in cabinet, Winston Churchill, he banged the table, he said, call it a lot. He got so fed up with the public press, the, the I mean, go on, nothing has changed. This is 2017, the Daily Mail, the Express, foreigners, who needs them, send them home. Churchill got so fed up that we all, all these, Emigrants that came from Germany and Austria were interned in the Isle of Man. Eventually I ended up in the Isle of Man after many camps. And I was in the Isle of Man for 10 months. And I was eventually released because I was under the age of internment, you know, bureaucracy. But the Isle of Man for me was a powerful learning organization. 
It was like a university, all these professors, all these academics giving lectures. It was, and we weren't ill-treated except in one camp. Uh, on the whole, we were reasonably well looked after. And after 10 months, I, I got out. While I was in the Isle of Man, uh, I got a new roommate and he tried to get me drunk. He tried to get information out of me and we thought there's something not right. It's only 10 years ago that I, I wrote to my MP. I said, did they really suspect me? So he said, write to the National Archives in, in Kew, which I did. They sent me a whole lot of stuff. Of course, this was an MI5 spy trying to pump a 16-year-old. Well, look, it's wartime. I fully understand my letters could have been used for illegal purposes. And uh, I've got all this stuff here. So I was touched by MI5. I was in the, while I was in Perthshire, the chief constable said, this alien must not be left at liberty. And uh, nine months later, after I went through four or five tribunals to be what I call denazified, you know, at the end, they said, this boy should be sent home to Glasgow and do some war work. So things changed within 10 months. But it was a, it was a powerful experience, but I, I got through it all right.